Are you? Hopefully you didn't bring tomatoes. <laughs> so, I, I want to say uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. As I go through and um, Ms. Franklin goes through uh, the presentations, I want you to keep in mind that none of this can occur without your hard work. So this isn't a Richard Bear show. It's not a Kenny Walker show. It's not a senior management show. It all occurs from all of you and your hard work. So I appreciate that. Uh, we have a lot to go through. Uh, a few housekeeping uh, initiatives, if you will. Uh, people that have the index cards, Katie and Carrie. So they've got their hands right out. I'm sorry, and Terry and have their hands raised. Uh, we're going to pass out index cards, and at the end of the meeting, we'll be answering some of the questions. We can't answer all of them. We expect a lot of questions. We'll stay after and individually answer some of them. But those questions that are appealing, if you will, to most of you, of interest to most of you, we will address those questions. So we'll pass out the index cards. If you write your question, we'll go through. We'll choose those. We'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm Richard Bayer, I'm the district manager, and I want to say good morning to you all again. Um, I want to get started because we do have a lot to go through. Uh, as is, uh, my way is to understand um, you all, I hope you want to understand what's going on in your district government. And there is a lot going on. So we're going to start with a few updates as we have at the last two Momentum meetings. First of all, Calumet Grove. Calumet Grove, you may recall, there are a series of sinkholes on public and private property up on McLaurin and McAlpin in District 4. So recently, as of yesterday, a notice of uh, commencement of construction was awarded by the Department of Property Management, Sam Morton BSAP, and we have actually work that has begun to reconstruct the outfall system within the rights of way of McLaurin, McAlpin, Locustwood, and Calumet, and down that outfall into the same pond. Why is that important? Well, it's important because many of you actually are part of the community watch. Many of you get questions. I want you to have a general awareness of these major projects. This is a, an all-in so far as the grounding work being done, the new uh, stormwater collection system being laid. This is a $1.4 million project. So um, about $950,000 has been awarded to Sirocco, the construction company doing the actual work. So it's a large project. We have a new member of staff, Jackie Jackson. Uh, Jackie, I'm going to raise your hand, who is the project manager on site, and we're happy to have him. We kind of stole him from Sumter County, so we're with him. Okay, so I don't expect you as we go through these to remember all this, but I want you to have a general awareness so when a team member, a resident, a customer asks you a question, you have a general awareness, not like, I don't know, they don't tell me anything. They're telling you something. Okay, 468 Fire Station. We have our latest fire station, all of you guys, our latest fire station, Fire Station 47. It's on South Morse, just south of here. The grand opening will be on July 9th at 11 o'clock. Um, it is pretty exciting because not only is it our newest fire station with a little bit different layout, but it also is a customer service satellite facility. It will be a hub for things like uh, ID renewals, um, things like gate card replacements, utility bond, or utility payment pay, uh, payout questions, uh, bond issues, also uh, taking in the applications for the various community watch programs. Now they won't do the work out there uh, in the truck on foot, around the houses for the home check programs and whatnot, uh, but the intake office portion will be through the administration office and also at this new satellite facility. So hopefully you'll be able to drive by or get by. It's a very nice facility, the newest of our district facilities. Shea Gate, Delmar Gate. Shea Gate, um, after uh, I lost a couple pounds of flesh going through the process, uh, Shea Gate is our only man gate that does not have a bathroom. When you think of our core values, you all know what the core values are, and you think of employees out there walking day and night down the side of the road uh, on Griffin in a ditch to a convenience store, not really what we would think that any of us would want to do at any stage in our life. So we are at the final stages of the design. A permit was submitted, or is going to be submitted, I think today, to Lake County for the addition of a bathroom. Now, why are we talking about a bathroom? 
it's $160,000 because it is a structural modification to the building and it's a large amount of sewer work. So I want to say thank you to the employees that work there as part of Community Watch at Shea Gate. And just a little update for you all with that's moving forward. Construction to start later this summer, early fall. Del Mar. Del Mar was another issue where we have the unusual circumstance of having the entry gate into the villages away from Spanish Springs with only one lane, and that lane is far from the actual gate attendant. So it makes our customer service functions of welcoming welcome people, answering questions, people don't understand why the gate is being manually operated. It makes it very difficult for those employees in the Del Mar gate. So there's a construction project, a little under $100,000, that's going to be started later this year. The permitting actually has all been worked out and the design's just about completed. It will add the construction an additional inbound lane into the villages and widen the sidewalk so it's an ADA compliant sidewalk. That's what's going on there. Par Fire Station, if you've been by a Par Drive and seen the Par Fire Station, to accommodate larger vehicle, a ladder truck, we're actually doing a uh, major addition to the Par Fire Station. This is a well over a million dollar addition. It will accommodate that bay as well as a total remodel of the interior of that Par Fire Station. The planning that goes on in so far as our fire service to make sure that we maintain that, really that four minute, 20 second mark for response is provided as one of our core services is really something that we hold close and dear to our heart. So this is again, a commitment to that service level. The wayfinding sign project, those are the reflective signs that are the uh, manual uniform traffic control device compliant signs that people will have on the multimodal paths, about 84 signs that are being installed with new uh, base foundations and all to make travel, especially in the evening uh, before dawn, a little bit easier for people um, in the golf carts. So that's actually underway. You see a number of side posts going up. We've had a whole number of questions. Uh, Mr. Baer, Mr. Wardenby, other members of staff, the posts are up, the foundation's in, where are the signs? Well, as you can probably figure out, the foundations go in, the posts go up, and the signs go up. So now you know the answer to that. <laughs> Growth and villages expansion, um, 70 square miles. Who would have thought that we would be 70 square miles, roughly 130,000 people, 67,000 just about household rooftops. Pretty amazing. For those of you that have been here a lot longer than me, just under two years, you've seen tremendous growth. You also know from reading in the paper um, and hearing uh, what is coming out in Districts 12 and 13, District 13 was stood off August 9th of last year, that we're going to have another 70 square miles south of State Road 44. So the area south of State Road 44 will actually be slightly larger than north of State Road 44. Pretty amazing, amazing. When you think of the state of Rhode Island, I'll give you a homework assignment, overlay that state on your villages map and you'll see just how much bigger it will be in 20 years. Pretty amazing. Um, something exciting, Brittany Wilson, who's not here now, um, but who handles uh, the board clerk operations as well as IT, led us through a wonderful update of our board policy, rules, and procedures. I know that's a sexy title. Many of you look very excited. It's very important for me as your district manager when I interface with the board, and you know there's almost 100 elected officials across 13 number districts, four commercial districts, a dependent district, the amenity authority committee, the IAC committee, and also then we've got the project-wide advisory committee. All those committees, 56 different accounts, that we total money through. So the, the having current board policies and procedures is important. How they operate and their expectations on us as staff is critical. Making sure that we can exceed those expectations is critical. Right now we're in the advertisement period for their rule changes. This governs everything on how they operate the meetings, how they fill a midterm vacancy like we currently have of board supervisors in districts one, four, and seven, and several on the ARC, the Architectural Review Committee, which I did mention earlier. So it's very, very important for us that we know what that mark is so we can hit and exceed that mark. So this was a very long process, um, at sometimes uh, very um, 
a full of acrimony and, and difficult conversation. We made it through it. So that is underway now. So a very important thing for us in defining how the boards operate. <coughs> BSNA, our financial management platform we've touched on, that continues to move forward with really a kickoff date mid-year next year, 2020. Um, it's exciting for us because it will allow us to maximize the use of our data, our financial management, for better management of our finances, but also to be much, much more efficient. We're looking at the interface that that system will have with um, some other technology platforms that we're looking at, uh, be it insurance, uh, be it asset management we'll talk about. So for us, it really leaps us forward into the current century, trying to get away from those green screens. So those of you who work on those green screens, you know what I'm talking about. Asset management, when you have um, $2 billion worth of assets with a B across our district government, it's important for us to be able to manage those assets. And you can't rely on just people's memories and spreadsheets. That's 1990s technology. Our residents, many of you, many of who you are, our residents of the villages, myself included, expect that we're efficiently managing all, all of these buildings. We're making sure that we can actually have a geo-encoded GIS-based system that we know for this facility here at Rohan uh, what the levels of maintenance are, when they're anticipated expected. We don't have to have members of our property management staff, our facility staff coming out and having to think, do I have the right plans? Uh, do I know uh, what filter do I, because you have all of these buildings. That, this, this system will enable us, a GIS-based system, to manage all of our facilities in a way that we are able to predict and compare and contrast what is happening facility to facility. Why is the energy use at Rohan so much more than perhaps at a similar floor plate facility? Now, I'm not saying they're propping the, propping the doors open for you for your recreation managers. That's a joke. So, um, so a very important system. GIS is really going to be the foundation for asset management. That's geographic information systems. It's a geocoded like a street address for every single data point. Associated in, if you will, a platform layer of like data points and like infrastructure. Sumter County, other counties and cities of our size actually have already embarked on this. They use this platform for a multitude of things, including the formulation of data analytical standards to be able to set our budgets. Very important. And I will go forward for almost a million dollars to catch up, catch up the district with technology to move forward with a, um, a, cartar a cartography based system that in 3D you will be able to almost uh, have the data collected and see as the vehicle moves down and collects every piece of data on the roadway. It's almost like Star Wars technology. It's something that the jurisdiction, the district, really needs to have and it will be considered by the board as far as the GIS platform piece um, next month in July. So really a big step forward. Uh, document imaging, um, we are moving into our current technology from DocuSphere. That migration is probably about halfway done. Uh, that is important to us because it removes us from not only paper documents, but it allows us to access the many records and files that we have to manage for both public record inspection, but also for our use. Fleet procurement and maintenance. Many people ask me, where is my new vehicle? When is my new vehicle coming in? Well, we have moved actually to a lease uh, type of acquisition for our fleet. Our fleet of 160 plus vehicles is comparatively small when you look at other jurisdictions. It doesn't really make sense for us to maintain in-house and also for us to purchase those vehicles. That rolling stock has value. We want to reinvest that value into things like our employee needs that you'll hear about uh, with Deb Franklin. By leasing our vehicles, by outsourcing our maintenance, we will be saving roughly, uh, well, over, well over a million dollars every two years. That is real money to be reinvested in what our needs are in technology, employee needs, and other facility needs. So really a, a very good plan. Many of you have received those vehicles. 
We have a conversion plan from own to lease. And so those that receive them, I think what their issue is, I don't care whether the district owns my vehicle or leases my vehicle. I want a clean, air-conditioned, well-running vehicle. And then my add-on is that provides a professional representation of the district government. Salt waste and, uh, I'm sorry, the, the last part, fleet maintenance. Fleet maintenance we have moved from a, uh, a maintenance philosophy that was decentralized, as many of our philosophies are, where each department managed and maintained its own vehicles. We had a small staff of three people uh, in the, uh, the public safety area that maintained their vehicles. Um, that is no longer existing. Um, of course, Marty has passed away. Great, great employee. An employee left us and retired, and then another employee took employment with the district's assistance over at Sumter County. Sumter County is maintaining, doing that sort of routine and even beyond routine maintenance in their Powell and Burnset uh, fleet maintenance building, right behind where the bronze dome is at the county building. They are maintaining our, our vehicles at no cost. If that saves the district tons of money. You're going to hear that theme over and over. Efficiency and saving money. Because when you hear Ms. Franklin's presentation, you're going to hear about how much money we need to implement the comp. I don't how excited she is. I'm against the door. She's excited. She's got white on too. That all works great. So the comp and pay program. Something has to support it. Money. So that's where it's coming from. The next issue is um, salt waste management and recycling. Many of you may have read the paper, uh, may, may have seen online comments that we had a wonderful salt waste management and recycling uh, workshop as part of the North Sumter County Utility Dependent District, ENSCA. Uh, that was last Thursday. We had 150 people attend. We are focused on what we are doing in the ever-changing global and national market with recyclables and solid waste management with our solid waste. The hundreds of tons that we, 67,000 households produce and all the rec centers and commercial facilities is big business. It's roughly 3% of our overall $355 million budget. At just under $10 million, this waste stream and solve uh, this waste stream and recycling represents a major task of management of high priority for the district. So we are setting up and establishing a long-range, 20-year horizon solve waste management plan. Again, focused on the subsidies that now support recycling. Not meaning that we're not going to do recycling, but should we be trucking our solve waste? and much of our recycling uh, total tonnage, about 15 to 20% per month up to Georgia, to a landfill. So currently, what we and many cities around the country, around the state as well do, is they pay for recycling for the separation at the MRF, the Material Recovery Facility. They, we pay for that out of our solid waste fee, and then those recyclables don't make it for the most part into that secondary market. They are then, after they are separated, there's no market because of limited need in other countries. China, the Middle East, limited need for our recyclables and they are then put back into the waste stream and trucked. The environmental issues, the financial issues are large. So that's a huge undertaking by staff. Well, this is an exciting one. Um, so for our, procurement, this is, for our procurement staff, this is an exciting one. So we updated the purchasing manual and all the procedures. We as a district, as you know, are managers of resources from contractual entities, are managers of products that we buy. So procuring those products in the best possible way is extremely important. This new manual, which I'm sure many of you have that procure, procurement authority, have it. and you know what the changes are, has increased the limits, therefore increasing that trust factor that we have on you managers that are unable to make those purchases. It allows us to more seamlessly piggyback on other governmental jurisdictions 
and to acquire those goods and services in a more cost-effective uh, effective way. Um, some of the things we'll be focusing on later this year and next year in 2020 calendar year, some environmental initiatives, looking at what we buy. I'm a big fan of buying a low-cost item, as you know, but I'm also a big fan of making sure we protect our environment. Having our thousand-year styrofoam cups doesn't really say that we are committed environmentally. Looking at how we make some other purchases that are not sustainable as well, big issues, and also um, added to dollars. So we're looking at that. I know that Mr. Blocker in the back, who's our assistant district manager, he's excited about this continued initiative. Right, Mr. Blocker? Yeah. I knew you were. Okay, and we made some pressing changes. You can hear that in his voice, right? Okay, getting into some of the issues that Dennis was thinking about. Our current budget process. So when you go through a budget and you have 23 new positions requested, $1.4 million of new positions, and you are working with your senior management team as a district manager and you are thinking, we have, as Deb's going to touch on, millions of dollars of needs in order to provide a competitive pay and pay and compensation pay and compensation plan. Um, you look at those position requests very carefully. So many of your department directors and your managers have submitted very well thought out budgets. They say many because not all. Many. So we have gone through those budgets and we will be um, adjudicating what positions are approved for next year with a mindful eye about some consolidation of services. For example, in Community Watch we right now have a person who's, who really serves as the gatekeeper for that entirety of the operation, the front end. We mentioned earlier that some of those services, those home check services, those adult care services, um, are being also uh, applied for at that community watch location right there next to the QR code. So we're now going to do that as part of the customer service function. Removing, for example, that TAPS or those TAPS off those employees, employee, um, will enable us then to make that more of an operation that is focused on what their core functions are, providing those services. But the paperwork, the reception issue, is something different than that we're able to, as we've set up the new satellite facility and hired staff there, and as we continue the customer service operation up at Lake Sumter Landing, we're able to consolidate that. So that's just one example of probably 25 different areas that we're looking to consolidate the services. Now, did I say eliminate jobs? No. Consolidate services. So we can have a more efficient operation. Um, that enables me then to look at those positions and say, hmm, receptionist, we probably don't need this position in Community Watch because we're going to have Ms. Duckett's staff and her team provide that function. So as you look actually at that service that we provide and you look at the position requests, when you interface with your directors or managers after the budgets are presented, in August, September to the board and the final decision is made, you won't see that 23 positions are being approved. If I approve, 20, or if I recommend and the board approves 23 new positions, that's the same pot of money that the comp and pay outcome issues have to be funded out of. I think you get my grip, right? Your fault. Okay. Amenity fees. Many pounds of flesh were lost with this process. Those of you that are property owners within the villages, reside in the villages, own property in the villages, you have a monthly contractual amenity fee obligation. The district back in 2010 timeframe began to forgive people that reached what was called a deferment or deferral cap at 155. Um, that was first done by the AAC, and then two years later, it was approved by the PWAC, the Project Live Advisory Committee, for those people living south of County Road 466. What we are seeing is, is that the CPIU, 
um, that would have been applied every year to those contractual obligations when you hit that cap as a property owner in the villages, the lost dollars that you were you were sitting here, you were sitting here. We every year were not then like when you get a social security CPI you raised, we were not getting that. So we were losing money, millions of dollars, over that 10 year period. We can no longer subsidize that. Uh, these recreation centers, which do not have uh, nothing against Walmart, but Walmart folding chairs that do not look like recreation centers when you move out into other areas, other counties outside the villages, take money to operate. And these recreation centers and the staffing functions take money to subsidize and operate. So those deferral caps were, were, were lifted by both the Sumter Landing CDD at the recommendation of the Project Wide Authority Committee and also the VCCDD at the recommendation of the AAC. So what that means is, is the contract that you sign with the developer whenever you sign it on your anniversary date of closing will increase by that CPIU 1.5, 2.2, whatever that rate is that month. Or decrease, in the last 14 years, it's actually decreased twice. So that, insofar as having a sustainable future for all those things in the amenity funds, north of 466 in the RAD fund and south of 466 in the SLAD fund, it continues that sustainability for years to come. Okay. Many of you are looking at me like I didn't come for a calculus class, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Okay. <laughs> Project wide fund. Um, we have um, we have gone through and we are looking at project wide fund very closely. Uh, the projects. I just want to say here that we took to the board an initiative uh, to clarify the definition of project wide fund in an agreement, making sure that everything that is a part of District 12 and will be 13 that should be in that that project wide fund agreement for common infrastructure. That's a common infrastructure fund for south of 466 was approved by the board. So that was a good thing, it was difficult. Many of you have been through a FICA, so Social Security Alternative Plan Workshop style meeting with Deb Franklin and her staff. How many people went through that as affecting the part-time employees? So many of you. So this is a plan that we are implementing that will allow the portability of the what would be the contribution that we would put in. Um, that is something that will occur on October 1st. It will have, for the majority of people, a very positive effect. And for some of you, you will not continue to get your quarters or your credits. And that's understood. I have to look across the entirety of the organization. This represents about a half a million dollars. It's going to be rolled back into the benefits for both part-time and full-time employees. We cannot adjust in the way that we are talking about adjusting the salaries without making sure, again, that we are operating in an efficient manner. This is a program that the federal government has sanctioned for local governments to employ when they are looking at their part-time employees. What that means for most of you is, that are part-time employees, <laughs> is that you actually will be contributing the pre-tax dollars into a fund that you take with you when you decide to leave employment with the district. Instead of contributing into a social security pool, which many of us will never have access to, and some may already be drawn from. So that's something that uh, there's been a lot of discussion on, and that will occur um, and start October 1st. So um, I think this is what you're here for, uh, for the most of you. I'm sure that you'll have some questions. Um, I want you to understand that as we make changes and go through this comp and pay plan, um, it is being funded based on the efficiencies uh, that we are accruing across those initiatives I discussed. It is extremely important that each of us understand that in prior years, we didn't discuss this with all of you. This was an issue of transparency that I and my senior management team felt very strongly that we would actually sit down and go through the thinking process. Now, we are going to have to have a further discussion on how we go through the specifics because we won't present those to the board 
until really uh, their August or September. And I support the BCCDD meeting in August or September. But I will tell you that the changes in so far as compensation and benefits will be large uh, and will make us competitive. And we're hoping to do it, hoping to do it, I know, I'm hoping, hoping to do it over one year, but it may be two. But we're hoping to do it over one year. Ms. Franklin? I was afraid I'd have to come up and take the microphone because it was going to give away all my good information. Which my staff has to do with me when I do training and presentations. So first I know that's a lot of information that you went through. So everybody raise their right hand. All right. I want to make sure everybody's breathing and alive to hear this. <laughs> Keep your right hand up, put your left hand up, put them together. Thank you. It's the warmest welcome I've had in a long time, so I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, let's get started. So, what's changed? You know, we did a comp and pay study in 2013, and we implemented it in 2014. And in that comp and pay study, we increased some salaries, we addressed some positions, and then we uh, made sure that we recognized tenure and addressed those things. So, what's changed since then? In 2014, we were only 40 square miles. Uh, we had 110,000 residents, 15 districts, 77 board supervisors, uh, resident lifestyle groups only 2,305, and employees we only had about 950. So fast forward to now, 2019, we have 70 square miles, 125,000 residents, 17 districts, 87 board supervisors, 3,075 resident lifestyle groups that we support and help. Uh, I don't know how that room reservations group by which is over there. I don't know how you guys find places for everybody. Now we have 1,200 employees. Approximately 840 are part-time and the rest of us are full-time. So that has created a lot of changes for us. It's created geographic differences. Um, we've gotten bigger. But it also means that there's a lot more required of us. There's a lot more expectations that we need to rise to. There's a lot more demands on our time and our energy. And thus, some of the things that Mr. Bear was referring to with regard to economies and efficiencies of scale and all of those kinds of things. So what's most important from my perspective, I know Mr. Blocker and the finance group and budget talk about numbers and finances, but from our perspective and our senior management team, how are we going to support all those needs? What's well, everybody in the room? It's our, what we call our human capital instead of financial capital. And what that means is how do we attract and recruit high quality and diverse workforce? How do we meet the needs of our, what we're doing? How do we reward and retain everybody once we have you here? How do we provide fair and consistent framework for assigning jobs? How do we classify those jobs and make sure everybody's working within those? What do we do to be competitive with our salaries? How do we consistently apply our pay practices across the board? How do we comply with laws and regulations that we're bound to? And how do we do that with our financial constraints of a fixed budget? And how do we do that and keep everybody enthused and, and excited about being here and making sure that our community is supported by that enthusiasm? So one of the tools that we use is a compensation and pay study. It's not just pay, it's full compensation and pay. And what that is, it's a methodology used to collect and analyze data regarding total compensation to help establish what our philosophy is going to be, what the recommendations are going to be that we're going to look at and want to apply for our organization, specific to our organization. So we review and update our current policies and procedures. We want to create a new job evaluation system. And we also want to look at our pay structures and make sure that's competitive and keep, keep all those other goals happening. And so what it looks like is something like this. Now some of us, if you're part-time, you're not going to really want to worry about or think that you're going to worry about benefits or rewards and recognition. But total compensation is a full spectrum of benefits, not just pay. It's health and welfare, it's income protection, it's wellness. Are how many people went to the health fair this week? All right, good. I know I saw a lot of the same faces. So it's providing programs like that, wellness programs, rewards and recognition, performance management is going to become more meaningful. Um, we're going to look at different types of awards that we recognize, not just our life-saving awards and things like that. Career development, training opportunities, opportunities to try and other, do other projects. 
And work-life balance, how do we accomplish that and have you do everything that we need but still be having a life outside of work? So those are the things that become our total rewards package. And for our part-time staff, that might just be the pay that you're interested in. For our full-time staff, it might be educational or, or something else. But that is everything that we're looking at when we look at those studies. And so how did we start it this year? We had a group called Management Advisory Group International. I'm going to refer to it as MAG. And we did a request for a proposal. And the committee selected this group for a couple of reasons. One is they specialize in compensation and classification for government entities, including fire and EMS studies, organizational reviews, analysis, all that stuff which was important to us because we are a government entity. We don't fit into a perfect box for everything that we do. They also have over 25 years with that public sector experience, so they have a lot of connections and a lot of information already at hand, so that was important to us. They've worked with agencies like Broward County, Daytona, Jacksonville, Lake County. Um, they've done Lake County. They've worked with fire departments, sheriff's offices, things that we felt that we are now more competitive with and that we want to make sure that we're using to benchmark. So what were the components of the study? What did we have them analyze? Well, we had them look at job analysis. I know that was a painful process for most, and we'll go through that in a minute. We had salary survey, which is looking specifically at salaries. We have them look at organizational structure, meaning how are we set up as an organization, and then also looking at internal and external competitiveness. So what's that mean? Job analysis questionnaire. Thank you to absolutely everybody that attended the god awful meetings and then had to wait several weeks, almost a month, to go and do those JAQs, right? But is that not what we anticipated? But those JAQs were really, really important. And it required the participation of both the employee and the supervisor. And let me tell you what that was. We had 1,152 staff members at the time that we did those JAQs. 710 of you completed them, meaning you completed them and your supervisors completed them. That meant 70% of the data regarding what you all do is pretty strong analytics for us. That means that that enabled us to have a better understanding of what you're doing in relation to what we did at the last study and how your jobs may have changed since that last study. We had 51 job titles that we had them analyze. That's every single job title that we have. We just didn't pick a few. All positions were analyzed. So in some of those analyzations, when you went through that JAQ, you had to get your information together to put together how much experience or education you thought somebody would need to do your job how much complexity of work it was, um, what, was it safe, what kind of things did you need to, did you need to be able to hear and see and feel and all of those things. What kind of judgment was required, did you work independently or did you have to work under the direction of somebody. All of those things create a classification and all of those things put you in a ranking of positions from level of um, intensity to um, in independent judgment and all of that. So that's how we rank our positions, that's how our pay grades get developed uh, in there. Then we had them do a market salary survey, and that meant that we had to work with them to identify, select, and then solicit comparable agencies. And we were specific about who we wanted to target. We wanted to target agencies that compete with us. We wanted to target agencies that were geographically competitive within our area, and not just local, local, but our fire department staff, they come from all over, so we're looking at some distance as well, not just right here. We want to look at structures that are similar to ours because we're CDDs and we're very unique and not everybody does what we do. So we had to look at some differences um, that might be similar to ours and attractive to the staff for any other reason that we could think of. So that's what we ended up working with MAG on. So we tar me, targeted specific agencies. We looked at counties because based on our size, we're now similar to a county, not just a small little city anymore. So we solicited information from Alachua, Citrus, Lake, Marion, Osceola, Seminole, Sumter, and Volusia counties. That was important to us. We did some cities. We did Clearwater, Gainesville, Jacksonville, Lakeland, Melbourne, Ocala, Orlando. You're saying we don't compete with Jacksonville, but some of the things we do are similar to Jacksonville. Some of the things that we do are similar to Ocala. Might pertain to your specific position, it might be something else. And we also looked at other agencies that might be similarly structured. School boards are one of those types of agencies. 
Hospitals are one of those types of agencies. And hospitals and school boards give us those administrative positions, our budget, our finance, our administrative staff, things like that. And then the ONIT, well, if you couldn't find anything on something, we went to the ONIT, and that's the uh, government puts together their own huge database that gives us information not only on local, but geographic. They can look at a position and say, what does it pay in Gainesville, or Ocapa, or the villages? So those are all the places that we got information back from. The third step was to look at our organizational structure. And Mr. Bear has already referred to some of that. That is where we're looking to consolidate and look at efficiencies and effectiveness. Where can we streamline and reallocate positions or do different things? That's going to help us uh, be able to get, like he referred to, some of the dollars that we need in order to do what we want to do. And you'll see that at the end. I could have told you this at the beginning, but I just want you to hear all this. <laughs> Step four was evaluate the internal and external competitiveness, and that's not just the pay. It's just not salary alone. It's looking at our benefits, our health and welfare benefits. How much do we charge versus everybody else in the world charge? Right now, our employees, our full-time employees, don't contribute for their single coverage. Not everybody does that. Those are things that go into our consideration for compensation philosophy. Leave time, retirement benefits, tuition reimbursement. That FICA alternative program speaks to retirement benefits for our part-time staff because we're trying to be creative with part-time people. What can we do for you? And those of you that have gone to the meetings, how many saw me, me and Pamela earlier? Raise the hands. Thank you for coming. You did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's some of what we're doing is shifting that ability and doing that and being able to take the savings to the district and roll that back into comp and pay. Professional development. If we have to look not just one year, three year, five years, we're looking at 10 years and the speed of growth that we have, we can't just think about today, we need to think about tomorrow, future timing. We want to look at succession planning, we want to look at on-the-job instruction, what are other places doing about special projects assignments. So all of this is a whole full picture. So where are we in the process right now? I have provided preliminary results. And they have recommended a pay scale and then recommended positions within the ranking of that pay scale. Senior management team, I've met with Mr. Baer, Mr. Blocker, I've met with each of the department heads, and we've done our own analysis to make sure that their assessments of the importance and level of a position matches what we know we require you to do in our organization. Sometimes people think something is here and it's really up here, and we want to make sure people are allocated correctly. Senior management's reviewing those results. We're going to continue to look at that. We're looking at um, preparing our response to MAG. And once they do that, we're going to give that back to them and they're going to recalculate what it's going to cost us based on what we want to do, what we're looking at doing, where we are, um, what our proposed pay structure would be. They're going to give us the options. Mr. Baer said, we'd like to do it in one year. We're trying very hard to do it in one year. If it takes two years, what does that mean and how would that function throughout? That's what MAG will do for us. Bringing staff to the proposed pay grades, the new grades, and also recognize tenure, length of service in the positions that you have. You just don't go right to the pay grade and that's it. There's a two-part process. Those things aren't simple calculations. Senior management is going to determine the final recommendation based on what MAG gives us back, and then we're going to present that to the board in August. Fingers crossed to the angels of boards and board gods and all that kind of stuff that they approve everything for us and then that will be implemented in October. So any changes that we're seeing will happen in October. So what's it mean to you? That's why you're all sitting here, right? What's this mean? So how will my pay be affected? Well, nobody's going to lose pay. Most everybody will see an adjustment in pay. From what we're seeing, we recognize that there are some serious adjustments and some minor adjustments. The only group that has not uh, shown serious need for adjustment right now is our contract uh, employees. But everybody else, there's some major adjustments that we need to look at. So what happens if my job is reclassified? Well, basically nothing. It's just going to put you in a different pay grade, and that may impact your salary. Again, nobody's going to go down. So if you move to a new pay grade that's recognized at higher compensation, but you're going to be getting that higher compensation in regard to the position that you're doing. If you're in a pay grade that stays the same, then you may see some adjustment based on tenure, but you're not going to see a cut in pay. 
You're going to, it happens if I don't meet the minimum requirements of my position. When we look at positions and we reclassify, we look at minimum requirements. What do you need education-wise, things like that? We'll be having a discussion to see what we can do to help you meet those minimum requirements. All right, if you need certifications, things like that, that's part of the training programs that we'll be looking at. Will my position be eliminated because of the study? This study was not intended to eliminate positions. Now there may be restructuring, you may be doing something new or different, or more in line with what we're asking you to do, but we're not looking at anticipating any position cuts. And are my benefits changing? Well, I hope so. I hope that we continue to provide excellent benefits and new benefits for people. FICO Alternative is one of them. Another one that we're looking at is more retirement benefits for our part-time staff. And will be rolled out in the next month and other benefits that we can add. Uh, one thing, anybody in the room familiar with Teladoc or Telemed, where you can call and Skype with somebody, raising hands, okay. That program is gonna be announced shortly. We've just incorporated that with Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's a great program, it cuts down on office visits for those things that you know that you can do over the phone and get that prescription and hopefully save um, you guys some money with that. So those are some of the things there. So what's it mean for the 2019-2020 fiscal year? Well, we're going to continue always to evaluate benefits and compensation and pay full-time, part-time, and our contract staff. And benefits, that means we're looking at adding an additional holiday. Right? We did some analysis and we see that we're still a little bit low on that, so we're looking to add another holiday in there to keep us competitive with our peers. Retirement benefits, we're looking to increase the match for general fund by 1%. We're looking to add that FICO alternative for most of you who haven't gone to a meeting. There's five more meetings. They're mandatory, so please come so we can explain it more in depth. Tuition reimbursement, we're looking to increase the level of reimbursement. If we need to have highly qualified people and we want to have that succession planning, we need to make sure that we have given you some additional support and benefits with regard to gaining the education that we're required. And then again, that medical benefit with the teledoc. Uh, professional development, succession planning. Uh, anybody here in the Emerging Leaders Group? Okay, this is a group that did a pilot program for us for training and has decided to stay on and work with developing projects and different um, special project assignments and giving us some input. This is how we're going to start developing the future. Sad to say, but I'm not going to be here in 10 years. Hopefully I won't be here in six years. So I need to now have somebody behind me to keep carry on the traditions and keep things going. That's for everybody. So that's what we're looking to do is focus more on those mentorships, those emerging leaders, on-the-job instruction. Everybody, if you look to the right of the room, the film, the videographer over there is Angela Patillo. She's our new training um, administrator, and she's coming up with some great programs. She's met with almost all the department heads and doing assessments on what we can do from the district side to help get these programs and initiatives moving. And then looking at special projects assignments, where we might say, hey, we need five or six people from X amount of departments. We have this problem. We want to hear from you how to, to solve it. So it's more inclusive, more engaging, and more input from all of you in here. So this is what you're really looking at, pay rates, right? All right. So in summary, there's not a pay group with the exception of contract staff that's not lagging behind. It was very clear in the study that we are behind competitively with our salaries, our starting salaries. Our district manager and senior management are in agreement that we are lagging behind. There's nobody that doesn't believe this. And that the quality and level of services that are expected of this organization are such that we are making sure that we draw competitively those people that can meet those requirements and those needs. The proposal being brought to the board will build bring us if it's approved to a more competitive level. And overall compensation and pay will be competitive within our markets. So we won't be losing people to other places and hopefully we'll have new people that knock on our door wanting to work here in the room. So when will I know how this impacts me? You still haven't told me, Deb, how much I'm going to make. Well, we can't do that yet until the board approves what we're looking to do. But all adjustments will be made for October of this year. So everything will happen that October. We have the FICO alternative program, we'll have pay adjustments and things like that. So this doesn't end with the study. This is an ongoing process. We're going to look at performance management. That is something that people say, well, it doesn't mean anything. 
going forward it will mean something. Last year all the senior um, management team worked with their supervisors to start looking at SMART goals and making sure that we measure performance and how well you're doing, not just that you showed up to work, but how well you're doing it and how well you work with others uh, within the organization and we're going to look at how we can recognize that. We're looking at enhanced training at District University coming up with tracks that um, you get certificates for completing different things that will help you get promoted and work within the organization. We're looking at the succession planning, developing our future leaders. All senior management needs to have identified who is coming behind them and how to develop them. And then also other forms of recognition, service, valor, community support, um, people that have saved lives in addition to our public safety staff. We've had, is Michelle O'Donnell in here today? Uh, she saved a life a couple years ago, CPR. We've had other people that have done those kinds of things. We want to make sure that we recognize that in a more public way. Uh, and of course, our safety. So, that's our presentation. We want to thank you for listening. But, now we have our Q&A. So did everybody, anybody have questions that they didn't get to? Oh, okay. So we've got some we've got some questions. Um, the first is, uh, what is the status of the Morris Avenue Bridge issue? So um, the Morris Boulevard has two bridges, as you know, and has it like a revetment around an island in the middle of the bridges. Um, back in 2016, there was a study done that identified three alternatives. <laughs> One was a littoral shelf that's a sort of natural sort of shoreline planting. One was to build a, a breakwater, kind of that barrier to just get that energy as the waves came in. And the last was to uh, put a series of um, armor stone and then um, above it uh, actually a smaller graded uh, stone on a geotextile fabric with fill behind it. That was to stabilize the revetment. It has nothing really to do with the bridges. The bridges are some county bridges. So the revetment itself uh, we are going through a uh, re-engineering, a value engineering process. Uh, we will take that forward to the board, the PWAC, and then Sumter Landing in August. Um, I don't feel like that the alternative that was selected for my engineering background is warranted given the um, wave action and also the costs. So um, what we're looking at um, is is a, um, we will use some rock, but it will not be as extensive. Uh, the two and a quarter foot uh, wave action occurs, um, given the fetch uh, on the uh, west side of the revetment, uh, does not warrant that sort of over-engineered design. Um, the, the cost back in 2006 dollars for the construction was $1.4 million. That was set aside as part of the project-wide fund. So that's already a project that's funded. Um, if we actually have uh, a project that is re-engineered, which I believe we will, they'll come in at less dollars and return that money back for other uses for that common infrastructure south of, of 466 of the project wide fund. Uh, the next question was, um, how many town squares will we build? Um, how many uh, more villages will be added on the Fenny side? So the, the town squares are not a district purview sort of issue. Uh, but back in February of this year, Sumter County, with a, an agreement for development and road issues, uh, the Board of County Commissioners uh, only approved the regional roads, regional A, B, and C roads, which are perimeter ring roads that are co-centric, that are south of currently the Coleman uh, Federal Penitentiary Correction Facility. And um, so as part of that agreement, there has to be an amount of commercial development that is equal to the average size of the three um, uh, town squares, the town square and the two others, and have to be built within Sumter County. So it doesn't specify a square, but it does spe specify commercial development. So that's a Sumter County issue. The other part of the question was, how many more villages will be added on the uh, fencing side? I can't answer that because I don't know. With 70 square miles, um, if you take the size of Fenny, which is one of our larger villages, uh, District 10, um, and Fenny are, are two of the biggest villages that exist, acreage-wise. Uh, so we have 13 right now. So um, you can kind of figure out there'll be many more because it's 70 square miles. So I, I don't know how big each one will be. 
Uh, is community watch on Benita moving uh, truck departures to new fire station. So um, I'm not really exactly sure what this question is asking. Um, who, who actually offered this question? So the only change that we're looking at is additional space that uh, Chief Wolf, or is Chief, uh, there it is, Chief Wolf, and then we had a shy person that offered the question. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we're providing space uh, down in District 12 behind the new fire station I mentioned. There will be a uh, an office building that's built there that will house um, some field needs for recreations or storage and whatnot. Um, there will be a DPM satellite office and then there will be community watch space which I think Chief is going to work with his staff and program out. Uh, that should eliminate some of what's called the deadhead time, that travel time, as people are responding to issues 12, 13, District 12, 13, 14, and this is going to be awesome. Um, are there future plans for remodeling uh, Paris Rec Center? Um, the um, AAC, the Amenity Authority uh, Committee, back in Jan mid-January, they have their capital projects workshop. They are not going to take on any remodeling or reworking of Paradise until the first responders is well underway. So um, there really wouldn't be any additional planning for Paradise insofar as rebuild, remodeling, reconstruction of parts of the building, um, probably for about 18 months. They wanted to do that because uh, their reasoning, as recommended by by staff was that we need the swing space um, from recreation center to recreation center as we move operations from paradise while it's under construction we need first responders to, to serve as part of that swing space and other recreation facilities to move venues into whether it be uh, you know, resident lifestyle groups uh, meetings things like that so it's probably about 18 months off before the planning for a paradise uh, rec center, a new paradise rec center, or rebuild would start. Will this presentation be available to us? So we're taping the presentation, so the taping of it and the presentation itself, like the former presentations we've done, the last two will be put on our, our website, so you'll be able to take a look at them, go back through them, as well as the, um, the videotape itself. So that's all we've got for you. Um, what I can say is um, I'm pretty excited, and I think, uh, I hope you guys are as well. Uh, this budget coming forward will, um, say the deep breath, will be unrivaled insofar as um, staff, uh, resource, um, common pay, benefit, and other issues. Um, I expect, I expect there will be pushback. Uh, not from you all, um, but I, I'm going to be some there too. Um, but I expect there will be pushback from members of the public who think that it is um, a large sort of a giveaway to our employee population. Um, I say that because many of our, uh, our our public come from long time, you know, government and other service backgrounds and live on fixed incomes. Uh, but we cannot take um, a 10 year sort of lag behind hit with our employee population as far as pay and benefits and expect that we're going to produce the results we've gone over in this first year today and other presentations um, and maintain those relationships with our employees where they can go elsewhere and have those same core values but work for someone else. We don't want to see that happen. So, so with that, that's our presentation. Uh, I know they're passing around the sign-in sheet. Uh, Jackie, if you hold up your hand, I see you have the sign-in sheets it looks like. So if you could just make sure you sign those. Um, I'm sorry there was a little delay coming in. Uh, we didn't expect quite so many people, but we're glad you turned out. If you want to hear this uh, rebroadcast, you can be back here later on tonight uh, at 5.30. So it'll be the same. It'll be the same presentation. Thank you.